I'm so excited to introduce our next keynote speaker who flew all the way from Toronto to be with us at the summit this weekend. Introducing the Honorable Marco Mendicino. He is a, uh, he was first elected as a member of parliament for Eglinton Lawrence, uh, which is my riding and back home. Uh, so really, really special to, to have Marco here with us this weekend. Uh, he was uh, elected uh, for that riding in 2015. Between 2019 and, 29, and 2023, he first served as Minister of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship, and subsequently as Minister of Public Safety. While in cabinet, MG, MP Mendicino led Canada's economic and humanitarian migration policy, introduced legislation to modernize the national security, uh, national cybersecurity infrastructure, and strengthen the federal government's approach to combating foreign interference. MP Mendicino also steered historic gun control legislation through the House of Commons, made significant strides to advance Indigenous policing, and chaired the Five Eyes Ministerial Conference in New Zealand, where he allied efforts to combat foreign interference and protect democracies. Before being elected, he served as a federal prosecutor for a decade, prosecuting high-profile cases of national security, including the Toronto 18. He also worked at the Law Society of Ontario, served as president of the Association of Justice Council and was the adjunct professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. Let's give a huge round of applause and, and warm welcome to Marco Mendicino. Uh, well, thank you very much, Cassidy, for that very uh, gracious introduction when you um, reminded me that you are also a constituent back home in Toronto. Uh, the riding is Eglinton Lawrence. Uh, I suppose this talk now qualifies as local work as well. So uh, it is, it is great, great to be here, Cassidy. Let me just take a moment to, uh, to thank you, uh, Professor Nigel Shadbolt, um, your entire crew. Uh, where's Will? Will, are you up there? And Will, for a wonderful uh, toast last night. Uh, give it up for Cassidy and for everybody for a very thought-provoking day. Um, I, I do want to... Uh, uh, also single out two other speakers yesterday. Uh, first, um, my uh, British colleague, uh, the Right Honourable Chloe Smith. Uh, I want to commend her for um, a fantastic talk, uh, and I thought that the theme that really resonated with me was uh, getting ahead of the challenges and the problems that are posed by artificial intelligence, and that is a theme I hope you will see evoked through my uh, keynote. And also to Nigel Toon, uh, who... Um, is, if nothing else, an optimist. And, you know, I was thinking about it last night. Uh, his book, uh, you know, How AI Thinks, ought to have a sequel. And the sequel should be, maybe, um, How Humans Feel. Uh, because I think how we feel about artificial intelligence and holding on to that sense of optimism is, is what is going to try, drive us through these uh, very uh, uncertain and complex times. And so his, his talk was... Uh, really quite, uh, quite, um, quite amazing. Uh, this is my first time at Oxford. Um, my daughters would love it here. Uh, I mean, it reminds them of Harry Potter when I've shown them some pictures. And, um, you know, I have to say, uh, it is truly uh, inspiring to be surrounded by these institutions um, and to be here. As you can see, um, the title of my keynote is Deep Learning, Deep Fakes, and the fight for democracy in the era of AI. And I assure you, I promise you, that chat GPT did not come up with this title. I promise. Uh, because if it had, it would have probably been this. <laughs> I do think we need to give the modernization of our democratic institutions bend it like Beckham attention. Um, they are looking increasingly as ancient as the castle in this town and ill-equipped to match the dizzying pace at which AI is evolving. A 2023 OECD report painted the picture in four charts. I won't go over them in detail, but you can see the meteoric trends in news articles, tweets, or whatever we're calling them now, scientific publications and venture capital investments in relation to AI. 
I'm going to follow these trends and zero in on the growing impact of generative AI on our elections and political campaigns. Not that the potential disruption that AI will cause to the economy and labor force in the next five years isn't urgent, it is. However, in my view, workers won't have a say in their own future in the global economy unless they are franchised in their most sacred democratic right, the right to vote. Now, in the political arena, and I have some experience uh, in this area, elections are akin to game seven of the World Series, or for those of you here in Europe, the European Champions League final. And this is what it can look like on a good night. Um, my wife would kill me if she knew I was putting this photo up here <laughs> at, at Oxford. But I put it up to sort of transmit the, the emotions. Their elections are exciting, they're excruciating. They are the ultimate crucible. And as a professional politician for nearly a decade, I have some skin in the game. And the game is changing at light speed. As you all know from your own feeds, it is impossible to do politics without being on social media. In 2022, there were an estimated 6.2 billion smartphone users globally. We are connected everywhere and all of the time. Our eyes are constantly glued to our mobile devices. It's pins and needles every week when I get my screen time average report. Am I up or am I down? Now, there are advantages to the ubiquitousness of digital. Uber, Skip the Dishes, and Apple Pay are all deliciously convenient. The flip side, though, is that social media has influenced our politics by acting as a megaphone for disinformation, which the G20 has ranked as a top concern in relation to AI. The consequence is that people are being bullied out of the digital town square as they become bombarded with rage, fear, and hate. And ra rage drives attention and clicks and profit. So what happens when your social media feed becomes a fire hose of distrust for science and evidence and conspiracy theories against government, media, corporation, and all things political. Stop the steal. Despite the United States Supreme Court having independently verified the results of the 2020 presidential election, a recent poll found deep divisions and doubts along partisan lines as to whether President Biden legitimately won the race. In a recent American survey, 58% of all Americans said they are just a little or not at all confident that elections reflect the will of the people, whereas only 42% are somewhat or very confident. Social media, whether by design or not, has become a driver for the market of disinformation. And the obvious question we must now confront is, how will AI impact the existing landscape and shape democracy for the future? Now, my view, we are at a fork in the road. AI has hit the accelerator, and we are all playing catch up. Since the release of ChatGPT in November of 2022, AI has captured global attention and has gained steam in the market. Some analysts estimate that by 2030, AI will add over $4 trillion to the global economy annually. Now, with that level of investment, the promise of AI is wondrous, and we've heard some of this yesterday. Solving climate change, curing cancer, preventing the next pandemic, creating new economies that might eradicate hunger and poverty once and for all. AI makes the previously unimaginable imaginable and puts these goals within our grasp. Likewise, AI has vast potential to sway the political process. 
Voters are already using ChatGPT to compare their local candidates' positions on a range of issues, which will then inform their choice on the ballot. Political leaders are beginning to use AI to allow their likeness and their voice to interact multilingually with their constituents in real time, as we saw New York City Mayor Eric Adams do very recently. And more creatively, it's easy to foresee a political party using generative AI to transpose campaign platforms to augmented reality so a voter could get the look and feel of what a new city in a yet-to-be-developed part of the country would look like. On the security side, law enforcement could deploy AI to analyze intelligence to prevent a cyber attack on Election Day. There are many positive applications that will help to protect democratic institutions and enhance voters' rights. On the other hand, if misaligned, AI can distort and deconstruct the foundations on which democracies are grounded. And we've already seen it. Deep fakes are being weaponized as purveyors of disinformation, making it practically impossible to distinguish what's real from simulation. And we saw very recently, right here, a recent example of that with the leader of the official opposition, Kirsch Marr, who, if you'd listened to the audio, unleashed a torrent of vulgarity and expletive deletives to a staffer. The only trouble was, it wasn't true. Now, this audio was leaked at the same time that he was addressing his convention. And although they got that audio down or identified it within 24 hours, that, at that point, there had already been a million downloads. And the downloads continue, as I think at last count, over two million. The damage had been done. Now, as a citizen, when you can't be sure who or what to trust or that the rules of the game aren't being rigged against you, confidence erodes. People lose faith. Our democracies weaken. And I believe we all have a collective and moral responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. I've organized my keynote into three parts. Where are we now? In which I will offer a quick overview of the state of democracy and a summary of a number of proposed generally accepted AI principles, or GAAIP, what I will refer to as GAPE. Where do we need to go? Applying GAPE to democratic elections. Here we will do a deeper dive into how we should apply GAPE to democratic elections and political campaigns and focus on some near-term practical issues that need to be addressed. And finally, what is the road ahead? I will close out by highlighting three broad recommendations that will hopefully serve as a call to action to jumpstart the modernization of our democratic institutions as AI forges ahead. I said earlier that we are at a pivotal moment. And at the intersection of this discussion, there are a complex set of legal, ethical, and political questions. At its foundation, democracy rests on trust. It may inevitably be imperfect as a system of government, but to paraphrase Churchill, it's better than all the rest. I'm an optimist. I want to be as optimistic as Nigel. And I don't presume to have all of the answers on how generative AI can mend and strengthen trust between the individual and the state. But I do believe collectively we have the incentive and the ability to leverage this technology and move democracy in the right direction as an engine for human opportunity and growth. So where are we? Much work has already been done to establish governance models for artificial intelligence. And for efficiency's sake, I'm going to provide a very short overview of the recurring principles that I have seen emerge within those existing models of governance. Principles that I will refer to as GAPE. In the next section, we'll see how GAPE can be applied, as I said. And before we do that, I think it's important to take stock of where democracy is in its standing of the world. Here's a snapshot. And take a look at the chart in the bottom right-hand corner. It is Sunday morning. We're all a bit groggy after the Cozy Club last night. Uh, the bottom right-hand corner, and I, I'm looking forward to the story about the after-after party as well. 
Um, the bottom right-hand corner where you see the two blue waves starting to uh, diminish. Experts differ on the percentages, but there is a consensus that the total number of people living outside of democracies is growing. So why is democracy backsliding? One reason may be that citizens doubt by a wide margin, a wide margin, whether they can influence the democratic institutions that are there to serve them. According to a 2022 Pew Research Center study, 19 countries surveyed said that they either felt that they did not have any or much influence on their political systems by a margin of more than two to one. More than two to one. Will AI close the gap or will it grow the gap in public confidence in future elections? To answer that question, the logical starting point is to examine the principles that have begun to coalesce around AI governance. And for my research, I canvassed domestic and international legislative frameworks from around the world. I'll highlight here Canada's cornerstone legislation on this subject is the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act, or AIDA. And last month, we introduced a voluntary code of conduct, conduct to guide businesses in the use of AI. Canada's approach tracks very closely to other international and domestic policies that we have seen in the space. The G7, the G20, the EU, there's a global partnership on AI, and the ethical principles that are being developed by many of the industry leaders in this space. And from a mile up, I believe we can distill these instruments into the following seven generally accepted principles. Safety, transparency, accountability, privacy, equity, openness and digital literacy, and finally, responsibility and the public good. Now this list is not intended to be exhaustive, and nor should the principles be operationalized or implemented in silos, independent of each other. Rather, GAPE should be interpreted flexibly where principles are interconnected and aligned to their overarching purpose, namely to promote the safe, responsible, and innovative development of AI in a manner that is consistent with the public good. So where do we go with these principles? How do they apply to the democratic process and specifically in elections? What's the first rule of thumb in any environment, whether you're on the road or at a pool or doing paintball or whatever? Safety. Safety first. Safety should be paramount in the creation of AI. And there are dual components to the principle of safety. There is the safety that we as consumers expect developers and innovators to build into AI. And then, and you heard this yesterday from Chloe, there is the safety that we as citizens expect our governments to ensure from potential threats to our national and democratic security that could be caused by AI. Now for developers, safety is achieved when AI is reliable, predictable, and produces a desired outcome that causes no harm to individual or public security. Future-proofing AI systems is critical, which is why safety needs to contemplate the possibility of misalignment of AI as Professor Bengio from Canada and others have opined. Safety requires proactive, vigilant, and rigorous risk assessment. And there's already a strong consensus that AI should be prohibited for certain things, including the development of nuclear, biochemical, and other weapons which are capable of creating mass devastation. There, these are the obvious examples, and there are others. Should there be an absolute prohibition in the use of AI in political campaigns and elections? In my view, this seems impracticable. It also seems unenforceable. A total ban may even be counterproductive given that AI will have beneficial applications. The more pressing question is what safety parameters are needed in the use of generative AI systems during the political process. Let's start with the reasonable hypothetical. Would it be appropriate for a candidate to produce an ad using the likeness of an opponent, using AI 
to depict them violating the law. I posit such a use would be highly inappropriate and, in fact, should be unlawful and prosecutable. And we'll explore the need for legislative reform further under transparency. Let me turn briefly to the government's responsibilities when it uses AI to promote public safety. It's not a stretch to see how government could deploy AI to facilitate facial recognition, intelligence analysis, and surveillance. In each instance, governments should adhere to three fundamental principles when using AI to preserve public safety. First, that there is a law or policy that authorizes the use of AI. Second, that the law authorizing AI balances individual human rights, including the right to privacy. And third, that the way AI is legally deployed by the state is itself reasonable. And where there are concerns about the state action in question, the courts and judicial oversight will have a critically important role to play in this paradigm as an independent guarantor of our democratic values. One last note on safety from the government perspective. There are existing international mechanisms in place and designed to mitigate against the threat of disinformation, whose mandates could be expanded to include elections. Two examples that come readily to mind are the G7 rapid response mechanism, which has been used to counter Vladimir Putin's propagandist campaign in going into Ukraine, and the OECD's global incidence monitor process. Both could be leveraged to coordinate real-time AI analysis on risks during elections, including where they may amount to foreign interference. And where the concerns are serious enough, critical incident reporting protocols could be triggered to inform the public. And together, these steps will promote the lawful and responsible use of AI to protect public safety, which takes me to transparency. The need for AI transparency in a democratic process is essential. Transparency is integral to trust. Voters assess candidates on authenticity, openness, and accessibility, among some other intangible factors. For this reason, political campaigns are necessarily held to a higher standard of ethics. Now, current election laws in most democracies require disclosure related to the sources of funding, assets, and other political activities which con contribute to a campaign. If abused, AI could frustrate transparency in the democratic process. Now, the better generative AI becomes at creating images that look, sound, and even feel like authentic human beings, the harder it becomes for voters to tell the difference. And in my view, as the bar for AI technology gets higher, so too should be for the bar of transparency in equal and proportionate measure. In the modern era of digital campaigns, transparency requires being open about data, algorithms, automated decision-making, and outp outputs generated by AI in a way that can be clearly understood. To extrapolate, I will focus on that one concrete example where we need an immediate term solution that we've already highlighted. The proliferation of online deepfakes is a pressing and substa substantial challenge right now. So what do we do about it? In the first place, there does need to be an urgent reconsideration of our existing legislation. In Canada, the chief electoral officer recommended that a new offence be created for knowingly making false statements about the voting process with the intention of disrupting an election or its final result. This would address a current gap in the law, but in my view, we need to go further. Legislation might also stipulate that candidates, parties, and actors within a campaign should have to publicly disclose when they use generative AI for communications. Tools already exist on this front. We've heard some of those, again, highlighted yesterday. Developers are doing extraordinary work launching various software which can embed itself through digital protocols, sometimes referred to as watermarking, so that we can inform the public about when they are experiencing and seeing AI. In my view, clear notification should be the standard. But what about non-legitimate uses? 
of generative AI for, the, for political advertising. Restrictions up to and including prohibition should be contemplated for any party who uses Gen AI to depict an opponent breaking the law or committing a violent act. Of course, rigorous free speech, especially during an election, must be a heavy counterweight to any regulation to avoid overreach. There will be cases that fall into the gray zone, such as when Gen AI is used by one party to simply paint an opponent in an unsavory light. And as we disentangle these knots, balancing the integrity of the electoral process and privacy interests will help to inform where to draw the line. And drawing it in the right place will be more of an art than an exact science. And while I will not elaborate on them now, higher standards of transparency are arguably needed when it comes to voter targeting and algorithms as well. And we can discuss these more in the Q&A. And I'll turn to accountability, because accountability as a principle requires holding individuals, businesses, governments, and other entities responsible for the development and use of technologies. The principle underscores that developers and deployers have a responsibility to mitigate the risks that AI systems pose and to be prepared to identify, explain, and remedy potential harmful outcomes. In elections, human oversight is critical to satisfy the principle of accountability. For example, while AI may be deployed to strengthen voters' rights and the efficiency of voting procedures, AI should never have the final say, obviously. Humans should always and must always ultimately retain the right to oversee compliance with the rules and the final vote, most especially where there are reaccounts. Now, in a similar vein, I would be remiss if I did not mention the open letter from last March, which I assume most of you are all familiar with, where world-leading thinkers called on AI labs to suspend the training of systems more powerful than GPT-4 for a minimum of six months. Their justification, their words, not mine, quote, AI could represent a profound change in the history of life on Earth. The authors wrote that the moratorium should be public and verifiable and that governments should intervene if not implemented. Now, the letter demonstrated how developers can and should apply accountability to themselves as a safeguarding principle, even when, even when it may hinder competition in the short run. With the trade-off being that it will help to promote responsible AI in the long run, which will be good for all. Let me say a few words about privacy. Privacy refers to an individual's rights regarding their personal information on how it's collected, processed, and shared by AI. Privacy requires upholding the confidentiality and security of user data and that AI applications do not breach these rights. Waivers of privacy or opt-outs should be clearly understood, informed, and revocable. Privacy may also require express consent and data anonymization when your personal information is shared with third parties. Although privacy exists as a statutory right in most democracies and a constitutional right in several, exercising it is very complex. And the individual's dilemma as a consumer is either to click agree, I agree on the unconditional terms of the platform or to be left out of the market. Now let's be honest, by a show of hands, when was the last time any of you read all of the fine print before clicking I agree? Is there any single person here? I don't see one, maybe a half one. <laughs> In Canada, the Privacy Commissioner's submission on the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act recently made recommendations to strengthen language expressly recognizing privacy as a fundamental right in the context of AI, requiring privacy impact statements of organizations who use high-risk AI, 
allowing individuals to authorize representatives in the exercise of their privacy rights, and flexible and fast adjudicative dispute resolution mechanisms. Privacy raises important questions about AI data driven personalization, surveillance, and analytics, and how they may be used to influence individual behavior, including voting preferences. And respecting individual privacy can strengthen trust, but it is obviously going to require ongoing significant reform. Let me say a few words about equity. Equity requires that AI systems be developed in a way that is fair and consistent with human rights and reduces systemic barriers to minority groups that have been historically underrepresented in our institutions and in our communities. This means that AI should be developed and trained to understand those existing biases and mitigate against them. Let me say unequivocally, the AI sector should provide equal opportunity and treatment to all individuals, regardless of their demographic characteristics, such as race, gender, sexual orientation, or other immutable characteristics. The goal of, AI, of equity in AI is to promote inclusivity and reduce disparity of opportunity. And in elections, it will be vital to ensure that equity is respected in all areas of the political process, including to prevent the malicious use of AI to impede accessibility or to suppress the vote. Which takes me to openness and digital literacy. Openness refers to democratizing AI and involves sharing information about its design, functionality, and its operation, and also to ensure that the public can understand and scrutinize. The principle of openness is also important to build trust, to foster collaboration, and prevent the concentration of AI power in the hands of a few. In the context of elections, openness is also necessary to promote digital literacy. And as we've discussed, mis- and disinformation are threats to democracy which could be amplified by AI. To understand how to mitigate these risks, we need to assess and measure the extent of the problem. A recent YouGov survey in the United States measured Americans' susceptibility to false headlines or what we refer to as fake news. In the aggregate, 36% of those polled received a low score. In other words, they were unable to distinguish the difference between real news and fake news. Alarmingly, only 11%, 11% of 18 to 29-year-olds got a high score. The survey found that generally, the longer someone spends time recreationally online, the greater the susceptibility to misinformation. To reverse these trends, we need to dramatically increase public education campaigns to help voters understand how AI may be used in elections. What is legitimate? What is not? Where are the safeguards? Digital literacy, even more than coding as a raw technical skill, needs to be fully integrated into primary, secondary, and educational curricula beyond. And I recall what Nigel Toon said yesterday about that third C. Citizens of all ages need to hone critical reasoning more than any other skill set to be equipped to deal with disinformation so that we can separate fact from fiction. And finally, responsibility in the public good. This principle implicates a broad set of ethical questions related to AI. The public good is the principle that AI technologies should be developed and used in ways that benefit society as a whole. That AI should be socially beneficial is similar to the democratic principle of responsible government, which states that representation is legitimized through majority consensus. Responsible AI will promote addressing global challenges related to the environment, healthcare, poverty, education, accessibility and sustainability. It emphasizes the importance of balancing innovation with the broader welfare of society. Responsibility works in lockstep with other principles, including transparency, accountability, and adherence to ethical guidelines to avoid harm, bias, and misuse of AI systems. 
So having summarized GAPE, what is the road ahead? I've already endorsed concrete suggestions that would create a new offense for fraudulent misrepresentation using AI during an election, greater disclosure obligations in the use of AI for campaign-related activities, and the proposal of creating an international network to combat mis- and disinformation during elections leveraging AI. Those are the specifics. Layered on top of those, I offer three broad recommendations that I leave you with. One, we need an international convention to establish GAPE that will set universal global standards for AI. Now, there are many conversations and consultations about AI that are going on around the world, including right here, right now. But what we don't yet have is a critical mass in a single forum to achieve a consensus on how the new rules of the road will work to promote responsible AI. History teaches us that negotiating an international treaty that is binding typically requires as a condition precedent a world war, genocide, a nuclear standoff, or an impending climate crisis. And even then, and even then, I put this recommendation forward knowing full well that some state actors may not be interested. Some state actors do not share our democratic values. And it is for that reason that as we have done in the past, now more than ever, it is up to like-minded allies to stay united and to show that it is far more in, in the interests of our adversaries to abide by the agreed upon rules of the road instead of going rogue. And if we're smart, we'll get ahead of the curve and do that work now. Second, we need to apply GAPE specifically to democratic institutions and elections. This means conducting a comprehensive gap analysis on political activities and voter rights that could be impacted by AI. I've offered some of my ideas. There's much more work to be done. Which takes me to the last recommendation, the urgency of all of this. The international community and industry leaders need to work together across institutional sectors and set concrete timelines. As we saw from the open letter last March, the AI train has left the station, and it isn't going to wait for democracy to modernize itself. We have to act with urgency, resolve, and solidarity. And I believe that we can do that in part because of the incredible conversations and actions that we are going to take coming out of this conference. Thank you very much. Merci. I think we have a, a couple minutes for Q&A. Um, yeah, let's, let's do it. And I think we have a volunteer that will be able to walk around with the mic. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Oh, girl. Um, I wrote this one on my hand, so sorry. Um, I... I liked the stat you included about people feeling like they can't affect elections. And um, while there are all these problems posed by AI, I kind of wanted to cite the example of in the UK government, there was a poll about uh, gender neutral bathrooms. And although the polis unanimously said, almost unanimously said, we would like gender neutral bathrooms, the government still decided to impose gender and this is an example of politicians not listening to the populace. So how do we avoid a computer says no scenario among decision makers when they are even unwilling to listen to people? Like, can we blame people for feeling powerless? And how do we avoid this scenario? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And uh, to be sure, I think it situates us in 
the moment that we currently find ourselves, which is that um, emotions run hot on virtually every issue that is, uh, involves an individual right or a human right, such as the one that you identified. And we are very much influenced, not only from our personal experiences, but what we are seeing online. And I would say that first there is the legal responsibility that we have as legislators to come up with a set of governance principles, and I've identified some of those, to guide those decisions so that it is not just about polling, and rather what should be based on a set of enduring principles. Um, but there is also the political reality. And the political reality um, is that staying connected um, really can only be accomplished if we put ourselves in the shoes of the other period. Some, sometimes referred to recently as the theory of mind. And there isn't a lot of that going on right now from where I sit in politics. There's polarization. There's very much listen to me, see what I am saying, um, but not as much what are you feeling, what are you experiencing. And I think it is incumbent on strong political leadership to be able to do both. And, uh, you know, I confess um, we don't always succeed. Uh, in fact, frequently we don't. Um, but that's part of the reason why I was so excited to come here, which is to exercise the nonpartisan part of my brain uh, and to kind of devote a little bit of intellectual analysis to these issues. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'll do... I think we've got time for two more, maybe. Or do you want to stretch it? Cassidy, it's up to you. We'll do here, and then we'll go to this gentleman. Okay, we're doing well? Okay, great. Good. Usually I get five minutes to present to Cabinet. So when Cassidy said I had an hour, I was like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> what am I going to do with all this time? Um, thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned about sort of having international consensus. Yeah. And sorry to bring it back to the UK AI Safety Summit, but I just wondered, like, from the perspective of Canada, like, what is the government or what are you guys expecting from the summit? What will the delegation look yeah. like from Canada? And sort of what is the what will success look like, given that it's supposed to be a global safety summit? Um, I'll start by saying I'm thrilled the UK is hosting the summit. I think it's um, an example of the leadership that the Prime Minister here and his cabinet and the government are showing when it comes to AI. And I know that we will have a very strong delegation present. Uh, Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne, uh, my, my colleague, my friend, uh, will be attending on behalf of Canada. He is the minister responsible for innovation, science, and economic development, or ICED, which is very much implicated on this file. Um, and I was listening very closely to what uh, Chloe was foreshadowing out of that summit, um, which is the need to look at AI through the paradigm of safety. And th that's one of the reasons why I feel as though um, the principles which I've listed here, I think, align to that by, by placing safety as, as a very, very important principle, a paramount principle. So the outcomes um, hopefully will be not just further dialogue, but rather deliverables. Um, and, you know, on this side of the ledger, in the political side of the le ledger, it is um, great to be able to do an announcement. Um, the more important part is follow through, is actually producing the outcomes that you want. And from where I sit, uh, having an AI sec security summit that is focused on public safety, etc., cetera, uh, will hopefully uh, do the same. Thank you, that was really thought-provoking. Um, my question is around whether you think there's a risk here that we conflate AI with misinformation mm. and that we end up legislating AI thinking that we're tackling all forms of misinformation. And a good example of that is perhaps the Keir Starmer video uh, or audio clip that you, you highlighted. If that were a voice actor 
and not AI, wouldn't that cause just as much harm? And we need our legislation to capture both kinds. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to finish on is that when we try to legislate AI, we, we end up trying to nail jelly to a wall because people's definition of what that is is so varied. Yeah. Um, if we just miscolor a, a video, yeah. is that misinformation or is that just us using Photoshop? You know. Br so brilliant question. Uh, brilliant question. I do think it's important to highlight, and you reminded me, um, I probably should have mentioned it in my remarks, but disinformation propaganda is not new as a phenomenon. <laughs> it is a threat to democracy since you know the beginning of this, the system of government. So the, the harm is, and I think the mischief we are trying to root out is the same. Its source, its ability to be amplified is different um, as a result of AI. And I agree with you, we should distinguish. And I went to some pains to try to delineate what are the good uses of AI, and there are many, from the bad uses, uh, which then creates uh, alignment. And one last thing that I would say about this. Um, actually, two last things. One, um, it is important to categorize all of these different subsets of information. Mal, mis, and dis, and putting those into sort of one side, and then obviously what is trusted and credible, reliable information. There's another really important component to that around um, independently verifiable, credible journalists. Um, and there are many people here who are exclusively dedicated to that work. So I agree with you, we really need to be careful and cautious so that we don't overreach and chill free speech, one. Two, um, there are very broad ethical questions and some even philosophical questions about whether or not AI can understand truth. And can it understand, by extension, um, disinformation? I mean, as I understand it, and I am not a technologist, it will absorb information, it, we can provide it parameters and give it criterion objective to help it do the, the segregating and the, and the organizing and the cataloging. But by itself, it does not at present seem to have that ability. Therefore, I think to your point, we, we, we need to be very thoughtful about how we move into this space and remember that democracy uh, is very, very rarely, if ever at all, about simply looking at one right and saying, this right shall trump at all times all others. It is much more often an intrinsic and a hallmark to democracy to have the capacity to balance these interests to achieve the best possible desirable outcome, which in my view, why it is a resilient system. It has its flaws, it is slow, but my hope is, is that we can give it a jump start. And, uh, and modernize it as we shape the future ahead in the era of AI. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.